Thank you so much for the worship. Thank you for joining us this morning to worship God together, to celebrate God. And I welcome you all to Fire of Life International Ministry, where we have come to serve God, to learn how to obey and to follow him, to receive strength, power, to be able to run our race in life where we have a common destiny together and a common purpose. And may God empower you to fulfill the purpose that he has created you in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you this morning. We appreciate you. We thank you for everyone that are here at the present and those that are fellowshipping online through mass media, those that are participating live, and those that will watch this record Later, Lord, we pray that your spirit will move mightily and your purpose will be fulfilled in every life. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have your seat. Let's quickly look at one or two things as I exhort you from the word of God this morning. And before Pastor Emmanuel will be here to teach to declare, to prophesy, to declare the counsel of God uh, of what heaven has revealed to him regarding his children this morning. Let's open our Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I want to read that one of the most popular verses in the Bible in the old world that everybody understand. And those that don't even know anything in the Bible, they know that this is faith in the Bible. Amen. <laughs> even those that do not agree with the Bible, they know that they have an idea that this is in the Bible. Amen. <laughs> that they knew that there was an issue that the first man, Adam, the wife, and some trouble. And those that use it to justify their weaknesses or their wickedness against their wife or against the women, they use it too. So Bible is available to be used as you want according to what you desire. You will use, have a verse. Those that enjoy drinking alcohol, the, the only verse they know is, is no, it was not Jesus that turned the wine to, the water to wine. That is the only verse they understand because they want to justify it. Because, let me tell you something. Men genuinely knew they supposed to obey God. And for that reason, they are looking for means to justify their disobedience. Saul said, God, when he was confronted, didn't I send you to kill the Amalekites to carry out my assignment? Say, yes, I did. And I brought some, some things to worship you. Did he justify his churrasco barbecue by saying it's a sacrifice to worship God. He knew himself that he wanted churrasco. He wanted barbecue. He knew. But he's trying, ah, but the Bible says that we can do sacrifice too. We sacrifice animal. God said we should bring animal to ah, Okay, that's fine. I link one together with another. But this morning, listen. Your linking may not work. It's not all the time that your smartness, there's a difference between being wise and being smart. Being wise is doing things rightly. Being smart is quickly attending to things as if you solve them. It's not all the time. You might be smart, you might not be using wisdom. Amen. That is why sometimes you see some people that are not smart, but they are wise. You may even think they are foolish because they are very slow. And you see some people that are smart, but they are not wise. But they attend, they are sad immediately, they do things fast. Ah! Oh, they are wise. No. It might not be. So let's read. I'm saying this. Please pay attention to this. Genesis chapter 3. Don't 
assume it as one of those things I've said to attend to yourself, to justify or to explain to yourself, to translate to yourself, to interpret to yourself, or in whatsoever way that your corrupt mind may deceive you. You will be delivered from corruptness of your mind in the name of Jesus. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, He shall not surely die. For God hath known, God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed three leaves together, and made themselves Aprons. What is this words to us? I want to let you know the battle against you to disobey God, they are great. The reason, some of the reason might even please you. Some of the reason might even go in line with what you like. From the onset, from the beginning, it became difficult to obey God. It became a struggle to obey God. Then you pick the fight. If you never know that it's a fight to obey God, I want you to know from today. Then you pick the fight. It's only one prayer I pray this morning when we are coming to church. I say, God, let me obey you become interesting, pleasant to me. Give me grace. I don't want to struggle. It's not everything you struggle for. That is why I want you to pray this morning. What looks difficult to you, to some people, is pleasurable. So sometimes, and as a deliverance minister, I believe so much in prayer to pray in some things and to pray out some things. When you discover your desire is not working with what is right, it's not all the time that what you desire is what is right. Listen to me. If you don't understand anything in deliverance, listen to this. You must know how you deal with the spirit that makes what comes to you as desires contrary to what is right. And that is why someone is listening to me this morning and your desire is to kill yourself. But today that spirit is dead in your life. That spirit is out in your life in the name of Jesus. What you desire. When you get out the word of God as a spirit, 
you invite word of God to your life and you begin to live word of God and in the beginning the process might be difficult but the grace, the persistence the continuity, you will discover you will get it and you will be able to live obedience life and every deception let me tell you finally as we pray what are the things that can manipulate you out of the word of God? Maybe some people are still waiting for serpents, one snake to come today and walk like this. <laughs> and begin, no, it, doesn't, it will not come that way anymore. He discovered that one that you know that one. Anything, any way the enemy discover, enemy don't operate that way anymore. Do you think that today the thieves that want to rob you, they will come with guns? And they know you call dial 911? They won't come with guns. Do you know how they come now? They will call you. I said, if you order anything on Amazon, press one. If not, press two. Any whatever you press like that and you don't order anything on Amazon, then they hand them to accounts. That is the way they come now. Enemy will come. But one thing with enemy, their purpose, their objective is the same. No matter the way they come, God will give you grace to recognize the way enemy is coming to your life today in the name of Jesus. I receive a call on my mobile phone and say, if you have ordered anything on Amazon, press one. If not, Press two. And I look at the number. It's a normal number. Amazon will not call me with normal number. And I did not order anything on Amazon. So I cut it. So I nearly press it. I now realize if I press any number, I could have been in trouble. Because they will be able to hack my phone. And access my account. Reset anything they want to reset. Because they will have the message back to them. I now called the person back. I returned the call. It was human being that answered it. It's no more Amazon machine. I said, man, your days are numbered. They will soon arrest you, I'm very sure. He said, what? And quickly cut it off. Amen. <laughs> is that man that has become that. So his intention is to rob me. But not the way I know that they put gun to my head. But the way I have no idea. But I thank God that I'm smart enough to be able to discover that. Ah, uh, devil will come to you in different form to rob you of disobedience to God. Not anymore the way you know. But all is the same purpose to disobey God. Through friends. You won't know that this devil came into you when that ungodly friend started coming to you. Through situation, poverty, circumstances. That is why a believer, you must pray hard. Through invitation, ideas, knowledge, books. They gave you some books. Have you read the lost books in the Garden of Eden? He said, No, I have not heard of that. I will give you that book. It's interesting. Have you read the book or uh, something about the history in Egypt? He said, no. Oh, it's wonderful. They are mystery. You need to read that. They did not. How many people ask you, have you read your Bible? They will come. It comes in that different form now. So stand on our feet. I want you to wage war against the devil. Are you bold enough or you, you fear him? Wait you are against him, the Father, any way the devil is coming my way, any system, any wisdom, any manipulation circumstances that devil is presenting for me to disobey you this one, I destroy it. I attack the spirit, the same whole serpent behind it. In the name of Jesus, I destroy their power. In the name of Jesus, any form, 
any way, any system, any situation, circumstance, the devil is coming. The devil want me to disobey you. Lord, I destroy this money. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. When Job heard that there was a wind, a disaster, and his son died, he had no idea of what the purpose was. He just the purpose was for him to deny God. Nothing more. To disobey him. And when he was crying, ah, oh, what is this? Oh God, I serve you. I offer sacrifice. The another news came. Another terrible news. And when he became so frustrated, oh God, why me? Why me? Why me? And the wife now came. Hey, Cause him and deny him. That's what. Said no, no, are we not? Are we not? And friends came. You are evil. You worth nothing. That is why all this tragedy is happening to you. Said, no. We know them. What something? I know. I know my redeemer live it. I want something. No. And he fought the bad way though. But the mystery exposed. That is why we have the Bible ready. No, when you go home, say, no, 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 I know. The <laughs> devil, you are behind this. <laughs> fire, 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 fire. Fire destroy you. You attack the spirit. You stop the process. You are going to pray this morning. I don't know the process that devil has been intimidating you to frustrate you. Stop the process now. Begin to decree. Declare and decree. I stop every process of frustration. Every process that devil is using in order to push me to the edge. In order to frustrate me. In order to make me disobey your word. To disobey your word, Lord. In order to stop me from following you. Lord, I destroy now. In the name of Jesus, I destroy now. In the name of Jesus, I destroy now. In the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name we pray. Finally, you are going to pray. I said, no, I'm not interested in all those kind of things. There's nothing, not, nothing changed to my life. I'm not going to church again, nothing. No benefit. I'm not following God again because I can't see it. Those that are not following God are better. You pray. That is what they want. Rob you of all the benefits. Make the benefits difficult so that you will not see it. But if you are smart, you understand how you operate. You command the benefits, you disgrace the devil. Begin to command all your benefits, all your son. Jesus Christ said, this is meant for son. This is for son. It's the son's food, healing, miracles, and all kind of good things. Begin to command them. And let any power that are stopping them, let them be disgraced out. Any power that are robbing, that are stealing, let the power of God destroy them. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we declare that all the benefits as your children, all the benefits as your servant, all the benefits, all those things that are meant for child, that you have declared that they are children's food, we claim them today. In the name of Jesus, we claim healing. In the name of Jesus, we claim deliverance. We claim all your goodness, all your blessings abundantly. As you have given us the life abundantly, we claim it in the name of Jesus. Joy, happiness, you say you brought us peace. The peace is meant for us. Anything working against your peace, they are destroyed. They are destroyed. They are destroyed. They are destroyed. In the name of Jesus, anything working against my peace, I destroy them. In the name of Jesus, I destroy them. In the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name we pray. I pray the last prayer, but I want you to add this to you. Jesus defeated all enemies. But there was one that he need to help, not to defeat, but to help to deliver. 
That was Peter. He said, Peter! I bind you. I cast that spirit in you out. That spirit that wants to manipulate you to manipulate me. That spirit that wants you to stand against what is purpose of God. That is devil. I cast it out of you. I want you to cast out it. Any area of your life that the devil has possessed in order to reach you. Any tools, anything close to you. Any soul, any personality close to you. Your boss, your wife, your children. The devil has laid an on for them not to be able to perceive what is that of God, but rather to carry out what is of the enemy. Lord, we deliver them now. That spirit, get behind them. Let that spirit disappear in their life. In the name of Jesus, any spirit that has possessed those things belonging to us, our tools, our materials, anything that are to serve us, to help us to obey and to fulfill the purpose of God. But the spirits of that the devil has possessed them to manipulate them to, for, to contrary to us, contrary to us obeying God. Well, we chase away that spirit. We send fire now. We send fire now. We send fire now. We send fire now. In the name of Jesus, let that object begin to obey us. Let that car, let materials, let all those things, the fridge, the TV, anything in your house, let them begin to obey us to fulfill the purpose of God. And spirit that want to manipulate it, to manipulate them against us, we cast them out now. We cast them out now by fire, by fire, by fire, by fire. In the name of Jesus. Thank Heavenly Father. We worship you this morning. We pray, Lord, your glory will abide with us. That this month will be a flourishing month. A month that the glory of God will shine in our life. A month that we ourselves will become a spectator for them to look at us. We have been looking at others, but we this month they shall look at us. It is time for us to manifest the glory of God, to manifest our destiny, to manifest the fruitfulness and greatness that God has deposited in our lives. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning. Our Bible reading of today is Second Corinthians. Chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter 6. I read in the mighty name of Jesus. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that he receive not the grace of God in vain. For he said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in the afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by poorness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by the by love and faith, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not strained in us, but ye are strained in our bowels, 
Now, for I will confess in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? I want communion and light with darkness. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, said the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, said the Lord Almighty. Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you. That shows the power of the spoken word over the written. That was beautiful. I saw things, heard things that I hadn't typically seen or heard. Thank you for being out there. Those of us who are in Facebook land, thank you for those of us who are in the building. We greet you in the mighty name of Jesus. And we know, we are confident, more than confident, that the word that is being delivered today is going to meet you exactly at your point of need. Let's go ahead and get straight to the point. I'm not going to be in front of you too long. This, let's go to verse 3 to verse 10. Let's go ahead and re read that, rehearse that into our hearing. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed, but in all things are proving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God. By the arm of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor and dishonor. By evil report and good report. As deceivers and yet true. As unknown and yet well known. As dying and behold we live. As chastened and not killed. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. I want to speak to you for a few moments about the contradiction of Christianity, the paradoxes of discipleship. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have not left us without witness of yourself, that your word is a light to our path and a lamp unto our feet that you give us guidance, you give us direction, you teach us where we should go in tough to navigate places. Lord, we thank you for the accompaniment of your spirit throughout our lives. We wouldn't be here today if you were not with us today. Lord, we thank you that you have blessed us thus far in the worship. We thank you for your servant that you've used in the exhortation. Now that we are entering into the depths and the riches of your word, Lord, I pray that you would not leave us. But empower me to be able to preach, Lord, as only you can. Teach as only you can. And I pray, Lord, this message would go to the ends of the earth. Wherever you would have your people to hear it. Lord, wherever this word is needed to be heard, we pray that your angels, your spirits, Lord, would deliver them. Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear, hearts to understand. Lord, I pray that you would reveal yourself to us in a way that we have not known you before that we would see you in a way, that we would get the picture, we would get the revelation, we would see who you've called us to be in the name of Jesus. Amen. One of the things that the enemy likes to do 
To keep us defeated and to keep us defenseless is to take away our joy. The Bible tells us that in God's presence is fullness of joy. And he says that that joy is actually supposed to be strength to us. It's hard for us to wield the sword of the Spirit. It's hard for us to hold up the armor and don the breastplate of righteousness if we don't have strength. And so one of the ministries that Jesus Christ has, that he's announced to us in Luke chapter 4, is that he heals the brokenhearted. David said it in Psalm 23. He said, he restores my soul. He restores my inner man. That part of me that's broken, that part of me that's wounded, that part of me that doesn't have the joy that the Lord would have me to have. The Bible says that God is here today to visit you to restore your soul, to restore your heart, restore your joy. And I want to tell you that lately I've experienced an uptick, a surging in joy. And it's not because my circumstances have improved in any way, but it's because I've had a deeper encounter with the Lord. The Bible tells us that God promises us peace that surpasses understanding. And how many of us know that it's not until circumstances are contrary to peace, it's not until your situation is contrary to peace, that peace that surpasses understanding can be manifested. The Bible tells us, Peter talking, he says that those who have suffered in the flesh have ceased from sin. Those who have suffered in the flesh have stopped sinning. What does he mean by that? suffered in the flesh you cease from sin those of us who have had to make a stand for our faith those of us who have gone on skid row for God those of us who have bit bullets for the kingdom those of us who have gone through rejection turmoil difficulty heartache for the cause of Christ there's a ceasing from sin because a great part of the power of sin is in deception when you go through the difficulty, when you go through the rejection and the heartache, and you come out of it unscathed, you realize now who it is that you really need, who it is that you don't need, what it is that you really need, what it is that you don't need. And so God will drive us into tough places. He will compel us to walk in places that are difficult, that are challenging. Why? So that we are not led by our comfort, but we are led by the comforter. How many of us know that the comforter <laughs> is not what we normally think of when we think of comfort? This is a daddy spirit that we have in the kingdom. See, mama will comfort you and say, oh, baby, you got a wound. Just go ahead and sit down. Just sit down and let me hug you. Oh, oh baby, I know that you're hurting. But daddy will tell you, keep fighting. Go forward. I know you're wounded in the game. I know that you scraped your knee, but you better keep fighting. You better keep playing. It's not over yet. And see, that's what it is in comfort. We've changed the definition in our modern time of what comfort means, but it's really with fortification. Come with fort, with fortification, with power, with strength. God will encourage you by giving you strength, by letting you know that it's not over, that you have more to accomplish in his name. And so the Bible tells us that the devil is the ruler of the darkness of this world. And I want you to understand that darkness has more than revelation. Darkness can mean evil. Darkness can mean depravity. Darkness can also mean that which is hidden, that which is not revealed. <laughs> See, the devil, he's a masterful deceiver because he's really good at hiding the caveat. He's really good at the small print. Tell Whitney Houston, hey, Whitney, <laughs> you sing real good. Why don't you come and sing for me? She started off in the church. 
You sing, you sing real good, baby. Come on and sing for me. I'll make it totally worth your while. You'll make a whole lot more money singing for me than you will singing for Jesus. But he don't tell you they're going to find you dead in a bathtub with your teeth rotted out. He tells you the good, but he hides the bad. That's your reward. That, those are the wages of serving the enemy. But Jesus is totally different. Jesus tells you, right at the onset, he tells you that there's a cross that you have to bear to be his disciple. That there is difficulty, there's hardship. He says that it's through much tribulation that you enter into the kingdom. And that's why I trust his promises. That's why I trust the good things that he said, because he's telling us the evil up front. If you go on a date with somebody the first date and they tell you, look, I'm crazy. I cut up. When I don't get my way, I'll swing on you. I might even pull out a pocket knife. But I cook well. I clean well. You know, I'll believe you <laughs> about the cooking well and the cleaning well because of all the other bad stuff that you said up front. Jesus tells you the bad stuff up front, but he also tells you that there's going to be a reward. I believe him about the reward because he was open and honest about the tribulation up front. And he says that compared to the glory that's going to be revealed through your perseverance, through you not giving up, through you keeping your fight, through keeping jamming as a Christian, he said what you're going through is nothing compared to the reward. You have Naira difficulty, but you have U.S. dollar compensation. Amen? <laughs> Amen. So let's go to the text. I want you to see what I'm saying here. So Paul is in a dilemma. Somebody say dilemma. Dilemma. He's in a jam. He's in a tight situation. Why? Because Paul, in a way, he's too good for his own good. God has called him to be a preacher of the gospel. He's an apostle. He's been sent throughout all the world to preach the gospel. And how many of us know that when God calls you out of a dark place, when, when he calls you out of, out of evil, Paul, Paul was crazy, man. He was he was working contrary to the kingdom, and he, and he recognized that all that he had done before he had come to the foot of the cross was garbage. It was done, and he realized that the one that he had been fighting against all this time was the Lord of glory. He felt like he was indebted to God. He felt like he had a responsibility to serve God. He said, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. <laughs> He said, I got to do this thing. It's not a matter, it's not a choice for me. See, see, you have a place. Thank you, Lord. You have a place in the spirit where you see people out there who are burnt out. People carrying signs saying they're burnt out. They work so hard and now they're just tired and now they can't, they can't make ends meet no more. They're just whipped. Do you know you have a place in the kingdom where you will get burnt out by not serving? <laughs> That's what Jeremiah said. He said, I almost quit. I almost, I almost gave this thing up. But he said that that word was just like fire. Shut up in my bones. I couldn't stop doing what I was doing because of the intensity and the immensity of the call. So Paul said, look, I know that I'm called to preach the gospel. He said, woe is me if I don't preach. I'm cursed if I don't do this stuff. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to prove to you, oh Lord, that this is not about my own aggrandizement. I'm going to prove to everybody that I'm sincere in what I'm doing. I'm going to prove my love to you, Lord, by not insisting upon my rights. Yeah, I have a right to be compensated. You don't muzzle the ox that treads the corn, treads the grain. I deserve compensation for what I do, but I'm not going to allow anybody to say that I'm doing this stuff for profit. I'm not going to allow nobody to say that I'm a prosperity gospel pimp. I'm going to do this stuff free of charge. And the problem with this is people who are carnal, people who are childish will actually take you for being less than because you don't insist upon your rights. Because you don't make people bark like dogs. Because you don't put on airs and slap people around like babies. There will be people who will disrespect you and say that you're not a real man of God because you're not too demanding. 
And so Paul talks about these super apostles in 2 Corinthians who had a prosperity gospel. And Paul knew, man, he knew that if this Corinthian church that he started, that if they favored, these, these Christians, if they favored the super apostles, the one that made it seem like Christianity was only about wine and roses, that didn't talk about a cross, that didn't tell you about had no want. He knew that if they accepted these super apostles and rejected Paul, that they would by inference rejecting Jesus also. He knew it. He knew it. See, if you call me ugly and I tell you that I have a twin, you don't have to see my twin to know my twin is ugly. Paul recognized that if they rejected him for what he didn't have, they were subtly rejecting Jesus because Jesus didn't have all the great things, all the pomp, all the outward majesty and splendor of these prosperity gospel pimps of that generation. Listen to me. So there's a contradiction, it seems, in the life of Jesus. Have y'all noticed that? There's a contradiction in his life. <laughs> he's despised and he's rejected, but yet the Bible says that the common people heard him gladly. He says that he doesn't even have a place where he can rest his head. But yet at his baby shower, there was gold. <laughs> there was frankincense. There was myrrh. He wasn't educated by the scribes and the Pharisees. He wasn't cultivated in the highest schools of learning. But they said, never a man speak like this. How does this man Having not letters, how is he so learned? Loved, yet hated. Despised and rejected, yet well received. A contradiction. One day they're screaming, Hosanna. A few days later they're screaming, crucify him. The contradiction of the life of Jesus. Why did they hate him? Signs, wonders, miracles, blind eyes open, lepers cleanse, paralyzed people walking. Why did they hate him? Because of his holiness. The same reason they hate you if you follow him. Because of his holiness. Same reason they hated John the Baptist. <laughs> Man, Herod, he was messing around with his brother's wife. Brother's wife had her daughter danced before her at his birthday party. And he said, mm, mm, girl, you something else. I'll give you anything, even half the kingdom. He said, I don't want that. I want John the Baptist's head on a platter. Imagine that. I'll give you everything I have. I'll give you even half the kingdom. And that's how some of y'all are. <laughs> That's how some of you are. God says, you can have all this stuff. You can have free access to the throne of grace. You have petition power. Anything you could ever want to need, I'll give it to you. But just give up your hatred towards people. Give up your, your, your cause. Give up your fight against this person. I'll give you anything. No, nah, I just want his head on the platter. I don't, the hell with the kingdom. I just want this person to be recompensed for their evil. But anyway, anyway. There are people like that, saints, who their lust for your destruction is greater than their desire for their own good. And it's because of your holiness. It's because of what you represent. You'll be surprised, saints. People will be out on the road. 
They'll find bags. I've heard stories. People found bags, $20,000 of cash, and they do the right thing. They're people of integrity. They try to find out who may have dropped the bag, and they will get death threats from random people saying, you gave that money back? What's wrong with you? Death threats from strangers. Why? Because the holiness of that action rebukes the iniquity that's in themselves. Man. Well, 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 it's not because of your holiness that we hate you. We hate you because of your hypocrisy. We hate you because of your pride. No, the most holy of Christians have been the ones who have received the most difficulty. The most righteous. In fact, the only Christians that this world will ever love are the ones who compromise. The athletes who never talk about the holiness of God, but give God credit when they win a basketball game, win a football game, throw a game-winning uh, touchdown. They give God credit. Those are the ones that the world will accept. But the ones who actually stand up and call the spade a spade, those are the ones that the world will destroy and reject. And if it's because of the holiness, is that why you killed Jesus? If it's because of the right, if it's because of the hypocrisy, is that why you killed Jesus? Because he was a hypocrite? No. Jesus was killed because of the strength of what he represented that went contrary to the desires of the people. And so the Bible here says that there's a contradiction that we are supposed to carry as Christians. There's a paradox. There's a paradox that lives in us. Because Why? Because we're citizens of two places. We have a citizenship in heaven, but we're also members of this earth. We're members of this world in a way. We live here. But our real citizenship, our real identity is heavenly. And so the Bible says that we are sorrowful, but yet we are rejoicing. Somebody say sorrowful, but yet rejoicing. Rejoicing. Hmm. There's sorrow in the world. Do you see it? I know of a missionary, he said, he's in Uganda right now. And he said, I've been through all these countries in Africa, and the one world, word that I can use to describe the world is sorrowful. This is a sorrowful, this is a suffering world. See, in Bible days, the crazy people were out there on the streets. The blind people were out there on the streets begging for help. The lepers were out there on the streets. See, we put all our people away. We put all our people in, in houses. We put all our people in hospitals. And so we're, in a way, we're kind of hardened to the evil that exists in the world. We're, we're hardened to the immensity of the sorrow that people in this world are suffering. But there's great, and that, that's why you need to do some more traveling. Talk to my kids all the time. Y'all who think you're entitled to this. Y'all who hate your life. You want to commit suicide because daddy's gone. I feel for you that daddy's gone, but there are places in this world where you don't know where your next meal is coming from. God has to be gracious to you in order for you to eat dinner. There's great sorrow in the world, and the world is in this happiness trance we got 9,000 channels on TV <laughs> to keep you distracted from what's really happening in the world. But saying, I want you to know that if you don't feel the sorrow of life, that's, that sorrow that you feel, that sensitivity that you feel to the human condition actually enables you to feel joy. Those of us who are hardened... Those of us who are detached from the human condition, you don't see how people are suffering. You don't see how people are struggling. You're also pu pushed away. You're pulled away from the joy because the same heart that's capable of sorrow is capable also of joy. And if you harden yourself in one, you harden yourself also in another. They used to ask the question, why is the man of God always so sorrowful? Why is the preacher of the gospel always so sad? <laughs> Why is he so grim? How many of y'all have seen that movie, The Sixth Sense? I see dead people all the time. <laughs> no? Nobody? It's a movie, The Sixth Sense. Check it out. But there was a kid in the movie. He, he saw dead people everywhere he went. He could see zombies everywhere. 
walking, talking zombies everywhere. And that's what the preacher sees. See, everybody is dead. Uh-oh. Yeah. Everybody is dead. If you're a Christian, you are dead to the world and you are alive to God. If you're a Christian, you're crucified with Christ. If you're a non-believer, you are dead to God and alive to the world, but you are truly dead. The Bible calls you dead. And the reason why men of God of old seemed to carry themselves with a certain gravity and a certain grimness, there was almost a sense of depression that seemed to be draped over men of God in times past was because they recognized the fact that people in this world, though you may see them laughing and smiling and carrying on, these are dead people. I see dead people all the time. You go to work every day with dead people. You go to school every day, five days a week, with dead people. You turn on the TV constantly, you see dead people. If you're sensitive to the Holy Ghost, then you are sorrowful for the evil, for what is to come for those who have disbelieved the gospel. But we also have a rejoicing that the world doesn't know about. We have meat to eat that the world doesn't know about. Jesus. For you, for, because you hid these things from the wise and the prudent, and you've revealed them unto babes. The Bible says he rejoiced in the Spirit. He let out a rejoicing in the Holy Ghost. See, Jesus' rejoicing was always in the Spirit. Even his emotions were tempered by the spiritual realm. His joy was in the unseen. Your joy as a Christian, saints, is supposed to be in the unseen. I want you to recognize, man, that even though joy is one of the signs of a believer, don't tell me that you know Jesus Christ. Don't tell me that you're constantly in his presence and you don't have any joy. I talked in the beginning saying that in his presence is fullness of joy. <sighs> but at the same time, saints, the enemy can work against your joy. The enemy can work against your peace. The enemy can make you feel like you're not quite as devoted as you were yesterday. Yes, he can. How many of us feel like that? Well, I, I used to be more gung-ho for Jesus. I used to have more zeal. The truth is that you have more desire. <laughs> the truth is that you have more of an appetite for God than you once did. And so it seems as though you don't love him as much, but actually something in you has been wrought where you, you're constantly wanting more. Your expectations are growing and growing and growing in God. And so the little thing that you do that doesn't measure up to your expectation, it hurts you a little bit more. Man, you don't want to have your faith in your joy. Your faith should bring you joy, but your faith shouldn't be in your joy. Your, your faith needs to be in the Word of God. Your faith needs to be in the promise of God. Your faith needs to be in what God has said. Paul the Apostle, man, he, he, was, he was battered in this ship for 14 days. And he said to the crewmen who were there with him, he said, look, the angel of the Lord told me that though this ship is being battered, though there's difficulty, there, 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 there's hardship that we're enduring, not a single person is going to die on this ship. Hmm. His confidence was not in his joy. His confidence was in the word. His confidence was in what God said, and the confidence in what God said is supposed to bring you joy. Well, I hope this is making sense. And so the Bible says also that we are poor. Hmm. Paul says it. Poor, yet making many rich. The <sighs> Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, that though Jesus was rich, he became poor so that we might become rich. And there are many prosperity gospel preachers who use that text to mean, they, they interpret it to say that Jesus Christ came so that we could become rich. That we could become rich financially. Now, I want to just park here and talk to you. Do I believe in a prosperity gospel? No. No. In fact, I don't think that you need God's help 
per se to become rich. You don't. Now we, I know in, in him we live, and, we live and move and have our being. I know he holds everything together. I know that we can't sleep, we can't wake up, we can't eat. I'm talking about true, intimate help. You don't need God to become rich. You don't. All you need to do is find out what people need and want and become good at supplying that. That's all you need to do to become rich. That's all you need to do to become prosperous in that way. <sighs> now the gospel, if you receive it, <laughs> there are anointings that are added to you. God will take your natural gifts and load supernatural power upon it. <laughs> Jesus says that you are city upon a hill. He says the city upon a hill cannot be hid. There have been times when I've been just doing work with my kids on the job and people have come out the woodwork just to offer me positions. Why? Why? Because when God does call you and when God does equip you and God does gift you, there's an excellence that's supposed to come with it. It's, it's residual in this case because that's not my purpose in life to counsel young boys. But I'm telling you, see, we, see I, I, I got to disabuse you of some lies. Okay, let's, let's stop for a second. Because I've heard men of God say, you know, these, these wonderful cliches. Your, your attitude determines your altitude in life. Sounds good. It's partially true. <laughs> your altitude is determined in part by your attitude. You will rise according to the, the attitude and the character you have. But saints, at some point you have to know what you're doing. <laughs> it's your ability that will ultimately determine your altitude in life, not your attitude. Your attitude will get you in the door, but your ability will keep you in the room that God has assigned for you to have. So God will enrich you. He will give you certain capacities that when they're used properly will enable you to become successful in whatever he's called you to do. But that's not the gospel. Okay, there is no prosperity gospel. There is no poverty gospel. I definitely don't believe that you need God to be poor. I definitely don't believe that. <laughs> but God does give you as a Christian. Hallelujah. In fact, I have a word for you, Pastor Adewale. <laughs> Lord told me that what you've done thus far as a believer, it has already made you immortal. The words that you've spoken into the lives of people, it's already made you immortal. The words that you've spoken, what you've imparted into the lives of people through your time of service and ministry, what you've done will never die. It will live on generationally. When you're dead, when you're in the ground, the people that you've helped, man, you, you, be, you won't even be able to see it. You'll be in heaven. But there'll be people graduating from high school, generations of children graduating from college, and if you could look down from heaven, you have tears wiping, being wiped from your face because you interfered in a cycle. Hallelujah. You interfered in a cycle. You interfered with a, with a, a movement that the devil had, a plan that the enemy scheduled for families, for generations of people. Glory be to God. But you make people rich, not necessarily by giving money, but by giving wisdom by giving knowledge, by giving hope, by giving community, by giving family. People out there killing people, people out there going into schools and shooting people up. She should have been talking to somebody. Should have had community. Christianity, there's a place that Jesus prepares for you in the spirit. And that place that he prepares for you will also invite you into community. That's riches. That, that's prosperity, man, to have friendship, to have people who will speak into your life, who, who, who have people who won't comfort you in sin. It's not okay. It's not over, but it's not okay. That's, that's, that's prosperity. And see, the devil will try to handicap you in the natural to make you feel that you're not qualified to minister to the lives of people. How are you who are poor, how are you going to impart riches if you're poor? 
that's, what, that's the mentality that he'll have you have. Y'all remember that, that car that I had? The former car that I had was just messed up, busted, ugly, disgusting. And uh, I thought it was pretty fine myself, but others didn't think so. So I went to uh, the paint store. I was going to go ahead and paint it up. And the guy that was working there, he said, man, you don't need to paint this thing. You need to throw this thing away. I said, why is that? He said, I, I would tell you that it looks OK, and you can put a coat on it and make it better. But I'm not even going to sell you no paint. This is, this is disgusting. And he asked me, what do you do? I said, I'm a preacher. <laughs> he said, oh, you preacher? You sure you're doing the right thing? You sure you're doing right? He said, well, uh, you know, the Bible says if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added to you. I don't, I, I worship God, man. So he was saying, he's asking prayer. He said, I, I serve the Lord. Look what I have, man. Look at my car, man. Look at your car. Are you sure you're serving God? <laughs> oh, man. But I knew that was just the enemy in the moment. I know that God always gets the last laugh when his children are mocked. I know that. So you just look past it. The devil will always make it. See, the Bible even says it. The book of Ecclesiastes, I think it's in chapter 9, where there was this fella who had all the wisdom, but he didn't have no money. And so the Bible says that his word, even though he saved the city, his, he didn't have no longevity. His word didn't have any staying power because of what he didn't have financially. But at some point, see, I don't think there's anybody, truthfully, I don't think there's anybody that's just 100% whole. I don't believe so. I think that the warfare that we go through as Christians is so constant. The devil is throwing stuff in your face so constantly. I don't know if there's anybody in this world that's just completely 100% whole. I don't know. But through ministry, through continually to, continuing to enrich the lives of people, despite what you don't have, I'm telling you there's a glory that's being wrought inside of you. I'm telling you there's a strength, there's a power, there's a gravity that's being developed inside of you that, that's being developed inside of you that couldn't happen if it were not for your lack. I'm not saying that God has imposed this upon you. I'm not going to give God credit for the devil's work. But I'm telling you that through continuing, going forward, not, not heeding the voice of the enemy, but continuing to be steadfast in what God has called you to do, I'm telling you there's a glory that's being manifested in you. Whether you see it or not, I'm telling you that there are things that are being wrought inside of you right now by the fact that you refuse to give up. You keep fighting. You wear the devil out. Wear him out. Don't let him wear you out. Wear him out. We talk about the devil as if he's just this, this immovable force. <laughs> we talk about him like he's just a force. He's just a power. No, the devil is a person. He can be discouraged. He can say to himself, man, what is it about this guy? Why does he keep going? Why does he keep serving? Why does he keep fasting? Why does he keep praying? How is it that I can't make this guy quit? He ends up being discouraged. Because when an intimidator fails to intimidate, he becomes intimidated himself. Listen to me. So you enrich people. You enrich the lives of people around you through knowledge. One of the scariest things that Jesus has ever said to me, he said, that every idle word that you speak will be accounted of on the day of judgment. Do you ever think about that in the quiet chambers of your life? Do you ever think, what is an idle word? A word that doesn't have any real significance. Just a word that doesn't mean anything. Just, just conversation that you have. You're not really thinking. You don't really weigh your words. You're just talking, just chit-chat, you know, just gossip. He says, and every idle word that you speak, he didn't say it for those who don't believe. Every idle word that you speak will be accounted of in the day of judgment. And so what is the job of a preacher? The job of the preacher is to bring something heavy to you. 
The job of the preacher is to give you something that you can think about that's going to enlarge you, that's going to challenge you, so you don't spend your time thinking about dumb stuff, gossiping about dumb stuff that eventually you're going to have to go before the Lord and answer for. To enrich somebody in knowledge. To, man, Hezekiah, thank you, Lord. Hezekiah, man, he, he got tripped up. He had all this wealth. He had all these possessions. The envoys of Babylon came. And he said, look, hey, look at what I have. Why don't, you, why don't you take a look at all that I have in the temple? And all that stuff was plundered. All that stuff was taken from him. What if he had shown him wisdom? What if instead of showing him his material possessions, he would have given him the word of God? That's that part that, that Jesus says can't be taken away. You have riches that you, when you imp that cannot be taken away. Ah, the true treasures of the gospel. The world can't receive it, <laughs> but you can. Thank you. And so there's a contradiction. Somebody say contradiction as I come to a close. Psalm chapter 118. The Bible says that David's enemies were swarming him like bees. His enemies were surrounding him like bees. And that's, that's, that's what the devil is to you. He's like a bee. And how many of us know that when the devil, <laughs> when he stings you like a bee, how many of us know that when bees sting, they lose something? They lose their stinger. And ultimately, what they have done to you is not as great to what they have done against themselves. They lose their sting and they also lose their lives and I want to tell you saints of God see my old pastor taught me something very important see the cross the tree always represents something that's hidden it always represents a hidden reality man of God talked about this morning the garden of Eden God says of every tree of this garden you may freely eat but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it and they thought they were going to be promoted they thought that they were going to be elevated, but it ultimately brought demotion. <laughs> and the same thing is true for Jesus, man. Jesus, they, they put Jesus upon that tree. They were laughing at him. They wanted to throw a party. The Bible says that the princes of this world would have known. They would never have crucified the Lord of glory. And I'm telling you that... As you go through trial, as you go through tribulation, as the devil beats on you, if you continue, somebody say continue. You continue in his word. Continue in the word of God. Be a disciple indeed. I promise you there will come a point in time where the devil will wish he would have never messed with you. you, you I'm not saying that he won't be able to afflict you no more. I'm not saying he won't be able to bother you anymore. I'm saying that you, you won't be facing the same devils that you faced on the front side of your difficulty, on the front side of your challenge. The devil will have somebody new to deal with on the other side of your trial, on the other side of your difficulty. So which one is true, saints? Go back to the word as I come to a close. Which one is true? Verse 8, by honor... And dishonor by evil report and good report as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known as dying. And behold, we live as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Which side is the true side? depends on which side you choose to see from. If you choose to see things through the eyes of the flesh, then everything that's evil is your inheritance. If you choose to allow the devil to name you, then you are the dishonored, the one which is of evil report, the deceiver, the unknown. See, the cross of Jesus Christ teaches us many things. Thank you, Lord. The cross says, I can almost hear the fathers. 
This is what the world thought about my son. But then the resurrection takes place. And the father says, but this is what I think about my son. Declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead. <sighs> Which side do you see from? Which side do you believe? Whose vantage point means most to you? Which side do you cultivate the most? Are you sowing to your flesh? Are you sowing to your spirit? Has God's has God's view of your life become your view of your life? That's what it means to have an understanding. When God's view of you is the big deal. And that's why he tells you, that's why he cultivates these disciplines in your life. He says when you fast, when you fast, not if you fast, when you fast, don't tell nobody. When you go out praying, don't be out in the street so everybody can see you. Do these things behind closed doors. Why? So you don't live dependent upon the opinions of men. The fact that I've called you to do it, the fact that I've told you to do it as your Lord and as your master, that should be sufficient for you. Listen to me, because there's going to be a point in time where the only person who's going to think anything good about you as my disciple is me. And those whose eyes I've opened to see you for who you are. But if you are dependent upon the opinions of people, then this is going to be your reality. This is going to be the way you see yourself. Dishonored, evil reported, deceiver, unknown. God wants us to be like Jesus. <laughs> Matthew chapter 16. Whom do men say that I am? Jeremiah, one of the prophets, he doesn't even respond. He moves on. What do you say that I am? And that's the big deal. That's what he comments on. He wants you to get to the point now where you can say, if you see me the way God sees me, you're blessed. You're blessed. If you see me as deceiver, if you see me as unknown, as dying, I won't even comment upon your opinion. But if you see me as honored, as well known, as rejoicing, then you're blessed because you know who I am. Blessed is he that is not offended. I think I'll close on that note. I thank you for listening as long as you did. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. If you wish to give, we have our offering bucket. We also have our cash app, 508-389-3589. 508-389-3589. Pastor Adewale, if you'd be so kind as to close this up. Bless us. Thank you so much, Pastor Emmanuel Ajuri. I believe you are blessed this morning. The paradox of discipleship. What it takes being a Christian. What you see yourself like. Joseph, he took to himself to be identified with God. When he looked as if God was not helping him. When he had the purpose or the reason to fight God. That God, why me? Why must I pass through these difficulties? Why must I, you show me the vision you show me? It's not what my life is all about. I wish leave it this thing and we forget about God. He showed me many things and never come to pass. Madam Potiphar, let's go. You have a better, can you pay a better hotel? <laughs> let's enjoy ourselves. What is in this life? He flee. 
say, I honor God all the time. And we can see what happened to him. Let's stand on our feet, begin to appreciate him. It's all about seriousness. It's a battle. It's a determination that I want to be identified with God. I want to be obedient to God. I want to see what you see in me and what you respect in me. That is what is paramount and what is important. Any other thing is not important, Lord. Father, we thank you this morning. We appreciate you for your word. We thank you, Lord. We pray you bless your servants. Increase him, strengthen him to open the eyes of the blind, to instruct the way you instructed, not the way this word instructs, not the way you are the only heart and finisher of our faith. Lord, we pray you give us that wisdom, strength, grace to continue and remain focused in you. Not to be bothered by circumstances, situation. Not to celebrate what this word celebrates, but to celebrate what you celebrate. And to continue remain a true Christian, a true follower of God, that honor God, honor his word, even in a perverse world. Strengthen us, O Lord, and bless us. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Lord, this is a month of recompensation. Lord, recompense us on our ways. Remember us. Let the book of remembrance be open regarding us. That your name will be glorified. Lord, we pray for this week. Let it be a blessed week. We pray we remove every hindrance, difficulties, challenges, frustration, poverty, death, sicknesses. We burn we destroy it on our way. In the name of Jesus, we pray for your favor. We pray for our blessing. We pray for your healing. Father, anyone that is hearing my voice now, that is under torment of devil, of evil spirits, as it's written in that Luke chapter 10, verse 21, that they return and the spirits subject to them. Though this is not what important, what is important that our name is written in heaven. But nevertheless, I speak to any spirit right now that is tormenting you. Any spirit right now that is afflicting you. Any spirit right now that is bringing trouble, tragedy, pain to you. Let them live now. In the name of Jesus, by my authority, by the power, authority that Jesus has given us. That the spirit should obey and submit to us. I declare and I command, let the spirit of affliction, of sorrow, of pain, of death, leave you now. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's share the grace in fellowship together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in love of God, and fellowship of Holy Spirit, be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Surely, God's goodness and our followers all the days of our life and we shall do in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Continue in his presence and God bless you and your household.